Hello, my name is Greg Gironda, Vice President of Business Development for DrugScan, and I would like to welcome you to Cracking the Pill, a journey of exploring abuse deterrent methods from the laboratory to the clinic to the real user presented by DrugScan and Alta Sciences. We have an exciting agenda for you today with presentations from Dr. Eric Kinsler from DrugScan and Dr. Beatrice Setnick from Alta Sciences. Following the presentations, Dr. Setnick will be presenting a candid interview with prescription opioid users to understand how these medications are being manipulated for unintended routes of administration. We'd like to thank these individuals for their participation and sharing their experiences. We will then leave 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. You're encouraged to ask questions throughout the webinar by using your control panel. Here's a brief background on our presenters. Beatrice Setnick is Chief Scientific Officer at Alta Sciences. Dr. Setnick has been working in the area of clinical drug development and CNS research for over 15 years and is a leading expert in the area of abuse and dependence evaluation. Eric Kinsler is study director for DrugScan's CAT1 Laboratories. Dr. Kinsler has been working in the pharmaceutical industry for more than 15 years, 12 of which have been in pain management. Over the past seven years, Dr. Kinsler has been mainly focused on the development and commercialization of abuse deterrent opioids. One last thing, during the interview portion of the webinar, it is important to unmute your computer speakers so you can hear the audio. And now to Dr. Setnick. Thank you, Greg. If we can go to the next slide, please. Today's objectives are to understand the strengths and limitations of in vitro laboratory and clinical testing of abuse deterrent formulations. We will also identify some of the current methods and preferences that recreational drug users embark on when they're abusing opioids and other forms of drugs from the subjects themselves, as we will be broadcasting a candid interview. We will also discuss how laboratory and clinical methods are adapted to reflect real-world practice in terms of the way that drugs are abused in the real world. Next slide, please. Opioid misuse, as you know, is an, continues to be an epidemic. In 2017, according to the Substances Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, over 11.4 million people aged 12 or older had abused opioids in the past year. This misuse is largely reflected with pain relievers, as you see in the large circle, and a small overlap of heroin use is also prevalent. However, most of the majority of the opioid use is related to prescription pain relievers. Next slide. The routes of prescription opioid abuse vary by the type of drug being abused. As you can see here, this is taken from a study by Butler et al. The respondents here are from individuals who entered substance abuse treatment facilities and reported their past opioid abuse and the routes of administration that they had abused by. As you can see from the table, the as intended is the oral route, uh, inhalation, injection, route, and chewing, as well as other routes of abuse are reported, and they vary greatly. For example, inhalation was most prevalent with oxymorphone, whereas injection was predominantly reported with hydromorphine, hydromorphone and morphine. So it can vary by route. Fentanyl was most likely to be re reported by other routes of administration, part in particular because it does often come in patches. Next slide, please. Abuse and misuse is not limited to opioids, uh, as we have seen the steady increase of amphetamine abuse since 2007. In 2017, 1.8 million Americans were reported to have used misused prescription stimulants in the past month. Also, inhalation and injection are on the rise. The figure shown here shows the trends of buprenorphine, hydrocodone in green, buprenorphine in yellow, and amphetamine in red. Although that's not as, as vast as the opioid abuse, it is increasing, and many formulators are now addressing the misuse and abuse of prescription opioids by also incorporating abuse deterrent features into these formulations. Next slide, and we'll hand it over to Eric. 
Thanks, Beatrice. Tampering, crushing, and manipulating opioids and amphetamines is a key method by which abusers circumvent the intended, often extended release properties to induce dose dumping, which produces the sought after rapid and euphoric high. Therefore, when it comes to the development of abuse deterrent products, it becomes important to remain educated on current trends of how pharmaceutical products are manipulated by and administered by real world abusers. In fact, even products that have been approved with abuse deterrent properties can easily be abused, especially when some time and effort goes into figuring out how to circumvent the abuse deterrent characteristics of any particular formulation. Once a recreational abuser figures out how to manipulate or tamper with an abuse deterrent formulation, they often share their experience and methods on the internet through readily available drug abuse websites like bluelight.org and arrowwood.org for other abusers to utilize and follow. Unfortunately, this may change abuse patterns to even more dangerous routes of abuse of administration or lead to abuse of other products. Probably the best example of this was the introduction of abuse deterrent forms of OxyContin and Opana ER. Uh, these new products were much harder to crush and snort, which led to a change in abuse patterns from mainly intranasal to the much more dangerous route of intravenous administration. Ultimately, this change in behavior led to the withdrawal of Opana ER from the market due to outbreaks of injection or excipient-related cardiovascular complications and spread of infectious disease. So in response to the ongoing opioid epidemic, the Food and Drug Administration has encouraged the development of abuse deterrent products to help minimize the risks associated with abuse of these potent pain relievers. Pharmaceutical manufacturers have utilized a variety of methods to prevent misuse and abuse, which include incorporating physical and chemical barriers that make these formulations physically hard and resist crushing or resist extraction of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. They've also incorporated aversive agents or opioid antagonists that is exposed only if the formulation is tampered with for the purposes of intentional abuse. And finally, development of prodrugs or new molecular entities that minimize the slow opioid receptor activation when administered through non-intended routes of administration. And then, of course, a sponsor may actually employ a combination of two or more of these for any given formulation. To uh, fully evaluate an abuse deterrence products of potential for abuse, the agency recommends a robust series of tests be performed prior to filing an application. These include in vitro laboratory or category one tests, in vivo pharmacokinetic or category two tests, and in vivo human abuse potential studies or, or category three tests. Overall, the results of these studies should be sufficient to provide the sponsor and FDA with enough information about the investigational product to make a decision whether the formulation can be expected to reduce or deter misuse and abuse in the general population. I am going to introduce the in vitro or category one test and turn it over to Dr. Seknik to discuss categories two and three. FDA recommends that category one tests be comprehensive and provide enough information to adequately evaluate a product's abuse deterrent characteristics and performance, always relative to the reference listed drug. Several of these tests are considered standard tests that should be performed by every sponsor. These include physical manipulation or testing how hard and time consuming it is to crush the drug, large volume extraction in ingestible solvents, in ingestible volumes. In other words, how quickly can you get the API out of the formulation, syringeability or the ability to extract and inject API in smaller volumes, and the potential to smoke or vaporize the product. However, based on experience with FDA and advisory committee feedback, we tailor each category one protocol to adequately evaluate both the abuse deterrent characteristics of the formulation itself, while accounting for the unique properties of each active pharmaceutical ingredient. For example, a formulation that has an API with very low oral bioavailability will likely be abused via one of many non-oral routes of administration, such as intranasal, intravenous, smoking, rectal, or sublingual. So a more robust evaluation of these non-oral routes may be incorporated into a study in addition to the standard test since the sponsor will likely be asked about these non-oral routes during the approval process. In the end, every category one program is slightly different and we work with each sponsor to develop a program that will help them achieve their goals and obtain the labeling they want for their product. A particular challenge that's observed for each category one study is that abuse deterrent formulations are designed to be inherently difficult to manipulate and abuse. Thus, these in vitro studies can produce inconsistent or uninterpretable results. To minimize these risks, we prepare detailed protocols, follow established standard operating procedures, 
employ robust analytical assays and experienced bench scientists, and finally have a leadership team that's proficient in interpreting these data and ultimately communicating the results of the study in a concise fashion to both the sponsor and to the agency. I'd like to share an example of how inadequate category one study has the potential to lead to dangerous abuse and abuse deterrent product. These are experiments performed with an abuse deterrent product that incorporates a gelling agent to deter intravenous abuse. As you can see on the top left, the formulation was first manipulated into a powder, then the powder was hydrated in an injectable volume of an injectable solvent. As you can see on the top right, this results in the formation of a gelatinous mass that cannot be drawn into or ejected out of a needle. Thus, this product appears to deter abuse via IV administration. However, when that same powder is pretreated or crisped with a heat source, such as baking in an oven or heating in a microwave, as shown in the lower left picture, the gelling properties of this formulation are destroyed, and hydration in the injectable solvent results in material that does not form a viscous mass and is relatively easy to inject. So in this case, based on the sponsors and our collective knowledge of the formulation's excipients, we would likely recommend that the sponsor incorporate a series of pretreatment experience to fully understand the formulation's potential for abuse via the IV route. And then finally, to provide a brief example of how one of our inhalation studies is done, we assemble a specialized smoking or vaping apparatus whereby a vaping device or heat block heats the dry or dissolved formulation, and any vapor that's formed is drawn through a membrane solvent or some other collection device with an airflow that mimics typical human inhalation respiratory force. After the simulated smoking experiment is complete, API recovery is measured on a collector and the heating and vaping device, which provide information about uh, how much the API was successfully vaporized versus how much of the API was either destroyed or remained in the original heat source. So hopefully that provides a general understanding of the expectations and processes involved in category one testing. And with that, I will turn it back over to Dr. Setnick to discuss clinical category two and category three testing. Thank you so much. And for clinical studies, we look at both the pharmacokinetic studies, which examine exposure of drugs under various conditions. Uh, many of the abuse deterrent formulations are extended release formulations, and of course, they contain active drugs. So it's important to understand also the potential for drug-drug interactions, including alcohol interactions, which can disrupt a, the integrity of a formulation, and food effects, which can also increase or decrease bioavailability, which is important either from a safety perspective for increased exposure, or potentially from a lack of efficacy. Uh, so all of these types of studies are very important in assessing the formulation itself and potentially if it can be enhanced for abuse with any type of alcohol or food. Drug abusers often combine opioids with other drugs and or alcohol, and therefore understanding the pharmacokinetic and potentially pharmacodynamic effects of these combinations are important as well. This has also been seen with combinations of opioids and benzodiazepines, which have recently had enhanced safety warning labels by the FDA. Next slide, please. The human abuse potential studies are the pivotal study that examines the formulation's robustness in a clinical setting. It, it, these types of studies are conducted in non-dependent recreational opioid users, for example, if we are using uh, evaluating a stimulant, we would be using recreational stimu stimulant users. And these studies assess both the intended and unintended routes of administration that may be possible in the real world, with limitations, of course. And the limitations are that there may be formulations and uh, unintended routes which may not be safe to administer certain formulations. So in the previous example, a gumming uh, agent or a gelling agent may not be, of course, will not be safely administered in a clinical setting. And in those cases, that type of testing is strictly done in an in vitro laboratory environment. Uh, we would not be administering products that have been so tampered that they would introduce noxious chemicals or degradants by heating or other extreme temperature conditions that would be excursions that could pose different uh, safety hazard to patients. So we're also very mindful of how the formulation needs to be manipulated in a clinical setting in order to safely administer it into uh, humans. The assessments that we do in the abuse potential studies include various subjective effects, and the primary endpoint is typically drug liking, which is essentially evaluate asks 
at this moment my liking for this drug is. And as you can see on the right-hand side, it's assessed on a 100-point visual analog scale uh, with strong disliking on the left and strong liking on the right. And there are also other visual analog scales, such as how high do you feel and other effects of reinforcement in terms of would the subjects be willing to take the drug again, amongst other measurements. Uh, so essentially, they're testing the likability of a drug and the willingness to take it again and the positive subjective effects, as well as negative that may occur by drug taking. Now, when we do unintended routes of administration, such as vaping or smoking or potentially uh, intranasal, uh, control chambers are required. On the left-hand side, you see a smoking chamber that has a controlled airflow uh, to enable the safe administration of uh, vaped or smoked products during these types of studies. Uh, also, uh, the potential to evaluate recreational drug users, as you will see very shortly in the video, uh, focus group studies can be very informative to get real data from abusers. And uh, most are very candid, as you will see in today's interview, about sharing information on what they do with drugs and how they abuse them and for the reasons that they abuse them. And uh, oftentimes, focus group studies can become very helpful to evaluate a certain formulation and get feedback from abusers as to what they might do with a formulation uh, such as that in, with its abuse deterrent features and what methods they may employ to tamper with a product. Uh, this is just as a preface, this was an interview with five recreational opioid users uh, that was played uh, in, recorded in August of 2019 this year and uh, it was located in our clinic facility in Montreal, Canada. Thank you for joining us today. We are at our Alta Sciences Clinic in Montreal, Canada, and today we have very special guests who are joining us to share their experience with recreational opioid use. These folks have also participated in our previous human abuse potential studies. So I'd like to welcome you all and start off the session by asking each and one of you your gender, age, and a little bit about your recreational drug use history, how you started using opioids, and what route of administration you first started it with. Male, 49, um, from Montreal. I started using uh, because of some pain uh, in the toe, in the back, and yeah, prescription drugs. And after a while, I took uh, yeah, just once, one for fun, and just uh, with a beer and something. So one thing after the other, I start using, but not each day. So it's kind of uh, I don't know, once a month or so. So that's it. Uh, male, thirty-three, and I was introduced to painkillers and morphine when I had a. A surgical operation on one of my ears in my mid-twenties and uh, I've used it recreational recreationally on and off uh, ever since. Female 28. I uh, first time I ever tried opioids was with my friends. Uh, we had just wanted to partake. We had done other recreational drugs in the past and this was just a new experience and I found it very relaxing and I preferred uh, oxycodone, a uh, low 10 milligram dosage. Male 43, uh, started using uh, opioids in uh, 2014. Uh, my body introduced them to me. Uh, First, actually, before that, I started uh, to try them orally, but uh, then uh, I just occasionally, and uh, uh, as to snorting, I used only Adderall, and my body offered uh, to try opioids. He said uh, it's going to be a good high, and he showed me the way to do it, and it was mostly uh, morphine at the time, and then I tried some other ones later on. Uh, male 22. Uh, I started using opioids when I was uh, skateboarding. In fact, uh, one one of my friends broke his arm and uh, got prescribed the uh, codeine pills. Uh, and we noticed that if we took that while skateboarding, we could like take big slams or take big hits and still continue and uh, not fail at everything and just have to go home. So we started with coding pills prescribed and 
every once in a while one of us would get hurt enough to get prescribed something else. We got morphine, we got dilated or any stuff like that and uh, been doing so ever since. And most of you, you've all tried oral opioids orally and have any of you tried intranasal use? You mentioned you had used intranasally. Uh, how do you usually prepare the opioid when you're preparing for intranasal use? Yeah, uh, that's the way my body taught me. Uh, that's uh, mostly uh, regarding morphine. Uh, so because it depends on the drug to prepare. The uh, morphine uh, thing is that uh, it's on the market, so usually available and be as a morphine sulf sulfate and if you try to do it uh, intranasally like without just just crushing and, and take after that without any prep special pre pre preparation pre 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 preparation then it's not going to give you a good high it's gonna uh, uh, be even worse than oral way uh, so the way he taught me uh, you have to have a key ingredients for that and it, not too many, like uh, they are uh, first has this uh, calcium solution that's called uh, uh, prickling lime, uh, it's a type of soda. And then uh, you have to use uh, hydro, uh, uh, hydrochloric acid, which is a key ingredient, uh, and 100% uh, alcohol, 99% alcohol. Uh, and there are two phases. First phase, uh, it's gonna produce you only. Uh, it's gonna be pure morphine, but only usable for smoking. Again, to create uh, the second uh, type that's good for uh, uh, intranasal use, you have to um, basically the way it's called have to bake it. Okay. Well, he obviously has a bachelor in chemistry. That is clear. But the easiest way to take um, opioids intranasally is just to break open the capsule and, cr and crush anything that's in there and the powder until it's fine enough so it can, it can snort up your nose. Right. And so for formulations that have been, for example, like OxyContin or formulations that are a little bit more difficult, have you encountered those that are more harder to manipulate or crush or snort? And have you, how has your experience been with trying to manipulate those types of formulations? Everything's crushable at some point. I mean, even uh, oxycodone, which is, oxys are pretty hard tech, but you take a brand new blade of like a, a carbox knife, like this exacto cutter, or a paint scratcher, and you can make like little cubes, then a spoon, or if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a mortar and pestle, I mean, that's gonna do the job. So everything's crushable at some point if you really want to. Yeah, a lot of the new uh, formulas, some of the newer formulas are ch more challenging to crush and they're a little, little hard, the beads are like even harder and stuff. But um, every, like you said, everything is crushable. But again, with the new formulas, a lot, you, you can snort it, you can, you can get a little bit of a high off it, but you're going to have a lot of gunk in your nose. I was going to say that the jelly ones, the newer uh, tablets, uh, they're not um, powder, pressed powder. They're, they've got a kind of a gel formulation that I would never even attempt to snort just because they, when they get um, crushed, they, they basically just flatten rather than crumble, uh, you know, like chalk would, like the other ones did. So now you're not really snorting that. I mean, I heard it's possible, but um, I'm not trying to snort the jelly ones. It's just and edible. What would you do with those instead if you if you encountered one of those? That's, that's when you know you get you gotta just take it the good old fashioned uh, down the gullet. Yeah, the the jelly ones you can only take orally. Yeah. Also, I wanted to add that uh, for let's say a new formulation, relatively new oxycont oxycontin ER that uh, there is a way that to get uh, from the to get away from the harmful substances you can uh, use a microwave and then uh, the coating and the uh, harmful harmful substances they basically melt down so you can snort them down. so where do you find out all this information 
have friends who <laughs> who teach me. And how? Where do they find out? Hmm. Do they experiment? I feel by or? the mouth of word. You can find word. you can find everything on the internet, or I'm sure you can find on YouTube. There's probably tutorials on YouTube that explain a lot of that stuff too. And generally, where do you obtain uh, your opioids? Uh, are you getting them from? Uh, some of you mentioned you had previous pain conditions when you first started with with prescription opioid use. Are you getting them through doctors, through friends, on the streets? If you can describe a little bit about your sources. Yeah, it's typically a family doctor or a doctor at a clinic, a walk-in clinic. And uh, in my case, it was a long time ago, I had back pain, so I have an history, and it's kind of easier to get pills from a doctor at, my, at that time. I would get it through friends, so family, or sorry, friend, yeah, no, friends of friends. And uh, they were typically not drug dealers, um, just regular people trying to make a little bit of extra money, but they would sell those kinds of pills to, uh, like, as basically they would go without just so that they could make a little extra money and we would um, be the people that would enjoy them basically uh personally uh, me so i managed to get from a doctor only like a small amount as to morphine of well, like lower doses which were uh eventually basically not enough and uh, also like a limited supply because the doctor wouldn't uh, keep prescribing you like it's only up to a certain point. Then, uh, basically, yeah, you have to know people. Like, you have to know certain spots in the city. Or you, you have to have special friends, right? So, who might deliver it to you. It's actually some guys uh, specialize on that. So, you just have to make a phone call. And then they basically might bring almost anything you, you want. It just depends on the price. Uh, or, another way, it's internet, but it's always risky that might not be delivered to you. Actually, it be just a scam. So only if you know that it's uh, a reliable resource, then you can call it. So it is possible to find them uh, on the internet yeah, as yeah. a source of opioids? Yeah, the dark web has anything, anything you want. And is and you mentioned it's sometimes unreliable if you if hit or miss, if you really get what you paid for. Are you concerned about the fentanyl that uh, is are in opioids uh, if you're obtaining them on the streets? Me personally, I've never been concerned about fentanyl. I've heard about it on the news, heard about it like in on Facebook articles in the newspapers, but I've never I've never come across it myself. Personally, I don't buy stuff on the street because I uh, I have a little fear about uh, fentanyl. Yeah. That's why if you like buy on the street, it's, it's important to buy like pills, not to buy powdered stuff, right? And then you know it's not basically fentanyl or, or fake fentanyl or like diluted or something. Or you just or you won't overdose because fentanyl, yeah, it's uh, dangerous, and uh, it's not even like a, a probably good high. It just will bring you to sleep, like you a small amount. So it's very dangerous. Uh, personally about fentanyl. Uh, nowadays there's many places where you can go check your drugs and for uh, people my age it's actually well received to just go there and be the one that gets this stuff checked. It's not like you, you could think that uh, maybe your friend's gonna see you like a narc or uh, like a uh, scared person but uh, no in fact uh, many many almost all of my friends when they receive drugs from a new source they are always going to make it check, right? or if they're not sure, they're going to make it check. Uh, so, it, given the scare with fentanyl, do you take any precautions? Do your friends take any precautions when you take opioids, like for example, have an naloxone nearby, or or take any uh, have a peer or someone who's not taking it just in case of an emergency? Uh, yeah, now there's a uh, oxy, uh, not not oxys, uh, you know the the stuff they inject you. I don't remember the name. The naloxone. Naloxone, yeah. Uh, there, there's even class that you can attend for free to how to use the kit and uh, I have some friends that have the kit at their apartment and ready at any time so yeah it's always nice to know that it's an option yeah actually a friend of mine 
a former friend of mine who used to be a detective for the Toronto Police Service, he would tell me stories that they would always keep uh, naloxone uh, in injection kits on standby in case they ever had those kind of issues. But I've never, I've never experienced that myself or any of my friends. And has anyone ever tried experimenting with opioids intravenously? I have once. Can you describe your experience and how that you let, got to use it intravenously? So what happened was a friend of mine, uh, well, I guess you could say he was desperate. But at the same time, he was just kind of a reckless person in general. And he was very close to me. So we had, he well, he can it kind of influenced me, didn't coax me into it, but he just influenced me like, oh, whatever, it's no big deal. So anyway, uh, we, he had these little disposable needles, very simple. He took a spoon and a pill, dissolved it with uh, what you see in like Hollywood movies and everything with the tip of a cigarette. Like he cut off just a little disc uh, off the tip of the cigarette to... Pour, like to filter out the um, the drug into the needle, right? And then he even knew how to tie up or tie off, they say, and uh, use the vein. Like so, he just found a bulging vein, and he would like push the uh, drug into it. So we tried it like that. I mean, it was he had done it before and stuff, I guess, but it wasn't much of a difference except the the time. That's what I was thinking. Um, it the amount of time that it takes to get into your system and to feel it is much shorter. So you you have that instant gratification factor where if you want to top up, like if you're starting to feel really bad or if you just are like, okay, I really want to do it now. So that would be like the only benefit. But other than that, the high was basically exactly the same. If anything, it lasted less time. So I wouldn't even, you know, I didn't get excited by it or into it and don't really recommend it or anything like that. It just felt exactly the same as um, ingesting it. And the type of high that you get from different opioids, do you have a opioid that you prefer to take over others and how, do, how are the differences and how they make you feel? Oxy, oxycodone is the one that I prefer. When I tried Percocet, uh, I found it really... First of all, I couldn't stack it, meaning it wouldn't get stronger if I took another one. And I really didn't like that because I would experiment with how much I need at that time. So if I'm taking one, I want it to be, if I need more, I want it to be able to take a little bit more and then I'll get where I'm trying to feel, what I'm trying to feel emotionally or physically. And um, with Percocets, I took three, four, five in a row one time and it just didn't stack. I was like, I was very disappointed. And on top of that, I had one beer and I was puking all night. So I literally could not mix the Percocet with al alcohol, and that really ruined it for me. So, um, I mean, it just made it like a much more unpleasant experience in general. And oxycodone, the ones I take would be time release. And I don't know if I just, like if Percocet has time release, blah, 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 like I'm not an expert. It's just the ones that I had, you know, they dissolved and like I could feel it. Um, right away for the Percocet and for the Oxy it was time release and I found that much more like pleasant much less aggressive and uh, just like it just did the trick I mean you know ideally that's not the, the drug that you use but the purpose um, it really did the job like so basically it would just relax me to no end and give me a little vacation physically yeah, I like uh, all three of them that I usually take. Uh, like, like I said, hydrocodone, morphine, and oxy. They, they, yeah, they all have their own specifics, like uh, slight difference. Some of them give you more like uh, body high, body buzz. Other more like affect your head. And uh, relaxation is different too. But lately, like uh, I prefer more. Uh, discovered for me uh, hydrocodone in a different formulation. It's called uh, uh, Zohydro, Zohydro uh, capsule. And the uh, thing is, uh, it's very easy to prepare. It takes, uh, the procedure I described before, it's gonna take you about 20 minutes. And uh, this one, it's already uh, powder, just uh, not uh, fine enough. So you have just to make it uh, uh, more, more 
better, more comfortable for your nose. And then you can just, so it takes basically one, two minutes. And uh, it's pure stuff. It's not mixed with any Tylenol or anything. And I find that uh, drug very really, really, really pleasurable for me. So how much time would you be willing to spend manipulating a formulation if, if it was more difficult to manipulate? If you were at a party or in a setting where you wanted to take an opioid, how much time would you invest in, in getting it ready for administration? I would say maximum half an hour. If not, I will just take a, a pill as it is. So would you tr attempt anything that would need like an overnight preparation? Would that be something that you would no, do? No, I, I would never do that, just five minutes or less. Uh, me, I think it depends because if I'm at, at a party, that uh, the drug is not the center of the the party. I mean, we're not all drug takers. It's, maybe there's people I don't know. Then for sure, I won't spend more than five minutes doing my stuff. But sometimes with my friends, we used to could be like eight people and working on preparing our doses could be lots of fun. And we never had to spend the whole night doing so, but. It, it was part of the fun to do it like in the kind of family family feeling so uh, if we had stumbled upon a drug that needed let's say four hours we would have done it easily as well it's the ritual of it I think sometimes it can be okay because if you're like if I'm taking it for relaxation for example right and I'm like okay I'm taking my micro vacation why not I would spend my time on whatever I need to be doing to make myself more comfortable. Like I could set up my room and in addition to that, I could work on the pill, like whatever, you know, cause I want to elevate my experience. Cause sometimes it's not about like party, especially with Oxy. It's not a party drug. It's not a stimulant. Like you're typically, you're not going out to get dizzy on Oxy. <laughs> uh, that's alcohol and any kind of other like stimulant um, category. Or like purpose, I would say. But the oxy is just more like physical muscle relaxation because that the pain that you get in your muscles, like from any kind of tension and everything, just melting away, it's just a relaxation. Okay. So you use it more to relax. And how about others? Uh, how do you use it in what kind of settings? Party or more for relaxation? How do you, What kind of setting do you like using it under? Uh, it could be both. There's a certain level of euphoria that comes with opioids. But me personally, I'm more... I'm more into more of a speedy uh, amphetamine kind of high because it gives you lots of euphoria and lots of energy. Yeah, uh, I, I would agree. So if you if you take uh, if you uh, taking opioids like uh, on a party, then it should be everybody should be on the same wave. Then it's okay. If people are on different drugs, well, and you just by yourself taking opioids, it's not it's not no fun then. Yeah, me personally, uh, I, as I said, I use it uh, while skateboarding because it, it makes me feel a bit like a, a Superman. You know, you can slam yourself real hard and still be going. And uh, I'll almost always mix it with uh, amphetamines to to have also the energy and the willingness to move and to, to run and to not sleep and to obviously spend the night at the skate park. Uh, but as itself, the, the opioid high isn't something for going outside and activities it's something for laying down and chilling yeah it's just kind of the same for me i don't really need to f to uh to take some opioids to have fun in a party it's kind of no use for me uh but if i want to relax at home without the pain just having a beer and enjoying a movie or something it's kind of more my stuff, myself being with myself, and I'm kind of a, not a uh, hermit, but uh, it's kind of yeah, my my little time. So if I use for recreation, it's kind of me, myself, and I. That's it. And so you mentioned uh, combining it with uh, alcohol, <coughs> with stimulants. Are, are there any other combinations that you use opioids under with other drugs? Uh, I have to use it uh, with some hallucinogens like uh, mushrooms or uh, acid and uh, it just uh, shouldn't be too much of both, just equal amount, then it works. Or uh, marijuana, of course. Marijuana can be mixed with anything. 
Yeah, I, I don't smoke cigarettes regularly, but when I'm on opioids, it feels nice to have a cigarette or smoke a little doobie. And has anyone tried smoking opiates? Yes, I did. Yeah. And what was, uh, how did you prepare it and what did you do? What uh, type of opioid did you smoke? Yeah, I smoke uh, morphine now and then. Yeah, and that was uh, the part of uh, uh, boiling it, boiling it, uh, uh, and then you have to freeze it. Yeah. So eventually, the crystals you get, yeah. uh, you can smoke them in a, like a say plastic pipe and uh, give you a decent high. And um, based on some of your experiences, if you were to design, say, a formulation that would prevent people from manipulating an opioid, what would you suggest? What would you put in there to deter people from trying to crush it and snort it or inject it? Uh, for me, uh, whatever things they're going to find to stop us from doing so, it's not going to work. Uh, there's always going to be a way around, and there's people really smart doing drugs and they're, they're going to find a way to boil it or to do whatever to it to bring it down to that basic powder that snores but uh as i did the study for uh, for this clinic uh, about uh, oxys there was a formulation that would turn into goop in your nose and would like stop you from breathing from your nose for like at least an hour and that was really really shitty that was that, that was pay not painful but that was that would be a, a thing that would stop me from doing so if i didn't know how to go around it you know i would obviously do it orally instead of snoring it anybody else have any thoughts it, on yeah that? i would just recommend the same ingredients they use for the gel the jelly uh formula uh pills or whatever um to prevent people from snorting it. Or they should design some kind of capsule that, I don't know, if you try to break it open, it, it self-destructs or something. Or, or something that you can't, you can't break it open. Or it doesn't come in two halves or something, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is the question about smoking? Well, generally, <laughs> trying to prevent uh, intranasal or intravenous or smoking or any, any route that you normally wouldn't take an opioid by. Because obviously for, for patients, they need to be able to take the pills orally, right? So they needs to be delivered, but if you were trying to prevent other modes of administration. That, that jelly thing really does work, though, because I went from doing whatever to just being like, oh, okay, well, I guess there's no other option now. The, I mean, I heard that you can still work around it and make it snortable or, or injectable or something or smokable, but... Uh, that jelly thing just changed the whole game, to be honest. So now you don't break it up. Because like, even before like I was snorting, I would break it up sometimes for the speed of ingestion because I call it like parachuting, where you would powder it with a spoon or a card. I usually would use the card and then put it into a zigzag and twist that up, take that. Because a zigzag will dissolve in like a second. The powder like dissolves faster or so I thought like I I don't know if that's even accurate but it's basically known as a faster route of administration like it gets you a little bit there a little bit faster but yeah when the jelly thing came out it was just like okay no we're just doing uh, traditional oral uh, ingestion so when you uh, when you use the zigzags do you use it to avoid tasting the powder or why would you or would you just crush it and swallow it directly? Like why put it into the, the paper? Honestly, the taste is the byproduct of it, but the initial idea is to keep it in one, one place. It's like a capsule. Mm -hmm. If you had uh, gel capsules, you might use that instead, but you know, ghetto, we would just go with the zigzag. I just wanted to say, oh, actually, what in my opinion shouldn't be done, it's like, uh, Basically, all this stuff that contains uh, paracetamol, because uh, uh, like combined with, with opioids, uh, it still can be separated. But some people, like let's say, they're lazy, right? So they just and you're not getting a lot of high from that, and they 
tolerance is ra rising like very rapidly so if you just keep taking it and it's really bad for your liver so you don't feel it right and the end result you might damage your liver easily so it should be something that doesn't want you to take it not that you take it and don't feel it well i think that that concludes our questions for today i wanted to thank all of you for coming out and giving your thoughts and your experiences with us today and thank you for sharing those with us it's been very insightful thank you well, i hope you did enjoy that session i always learn something new every time i have an opportunity to speak with recreational drug users and it's very evident that uh, many of them are, are very eloquent. Uh, they oftentimes can come up with some very complex methods and sometimes very simple methods for, uh, for tampering with prescription opioids and, and stimulants of that sort. Uh, so it is um, always, and as, as we've seen earlier in the presentation, new formulations come to the market, new drugs come to the market, and those trends evolve over time. So in order to build a better mousetrap, we always need to be learning from recreational drug users and the trends, societal trends, to be able to keep one step ahead of the game to curb and uh, address the, the problem of prescription opioid tampering and the administration by unintended routes. Uh, so as a summary, uh, we've seen f even from the video that opioid um, and stimulant users, for that matter, often manipulate formulations for unintended routes of administration. And uh, with some formulations, that can be become very dangerous, as we've seen with the Opana example. Um, the methods of manipulation will vary by the type of drug, the time, the trends, etc. So, for example, the one gentleman mentioned the manipulation of morphine to remove the sulfate in order to remove the sulfate and have a better ha high when they're intranasally administering it or smoking it. So that required a, a complex procedure for, for that kind of manipulation method. The, when the formulations with abuse deterrent features are formulated, these really require rigorous laboratory and clinical testing. And we work very hard from a laboratory and a clinical perspective to make sure that the methods that are being used uh, in the laboratory and in the clinic are complement those that would be seen in the real world. Uh, so the adaptation of these methods to the current patterns of drug abuse uh, always have to be considered. And as new trends such as vaping come on board, as you've seen earlier, that becomes an integral part of the testing battery for in vitro laboratory experimentation. Uh, so you see the, the users are, are very intelligent and can be quite creative with how they abuse drugs. Uh, so I think we will pause here. I wanted to thank you for joining, and I do think we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, Greg, I'll hand it over to you. Yes, hello. Um, if in your control panel, you could ask a question uh, by uh, touching the uh, questions tab and typing in your question. Uh, I have a question for, for Eric, generally, uh, with regards to the vaping. Um, I had seen years ago an OxyContin Express video where uh, there were picture, there was a video of an addict that was using a foil and putting a lighter under an OxyContin. This was with the old OxyContin formulation, mind you. And they were inhaling the oxycodone that was emitted from the, the vapor, uh, which seemed to me to be a very inefficient method of, of abusing a tablet. Um, how much recovery do you generally get from when you do your vaping experiments? You, do, you showed us a nice apparatus earlier on in the presentation. Is, there a, is it a viable recovery amount or how does it, how does it work? Yeah, it sort of it, it really depends on the API itself. Some some are uh, easier to vaporize than others. Um, for the most part, uh, opioids aren't necessarily vapable or um, uh, bakeable, so to speak, unless you turn them into the base form. Um, if you if you do you know what that gentleman was talking about, which is turn your you know morphine sulfate into a morphine base, that becomes uh, relatively viable and something that you can smoke. Um, mm -hmm. For the smoking, that becomes more difficult. For vaping, we've actually had some pretty good success, and that does work pretty well um, as long as you spend a little bit of time tinkering with the, the vape juice and the vape device and everything else. So it is, it is something that's probably up and coming uh, sooner rather than later. Oh, okay. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, uh, so, so there's a question here, um, I guess for both of you. Um, first, we'll start with Eric, though, to get a uh, in vitro um, perspective on this. What about abusing uh, skin patches or sublingual films? Is there anything that you would do differently to assess these products? Well, I think it's, you know, it's, it's you, we probably would put those through our standard tests. You know, a sublingual film, you would, you would probably want to know, you know, what's the API? Are they using them sublingually because it's uh, low oral bioavailability and they're using the, you know, oral mucosa to get through? We'd probably do some extraction studies to determine whether or not we can get that API out, rel- API out relatively quickly so they could turn it into, you know, an injectable formulation. Um, and then, of course, with all of these, like the, you know, dermal patches, um, what we see is that people are taking those patches, which contain a lot of fentanyl, um, and they take them and they chew them. And what we have is a, you know, a, a in vitro apparatus that we use to actually chew different patches to see how much API comes out. And even patches that, frankly, are um, technically been been already used, those patches are still contain a substantial amount of fentanyl, which can be extracted and either chewed or actually injected. Beatrice, I don't know yeah. if you have anything else to say from the clinical side of that. Yes, from the clinical side, I mean, we would be testing the the patches or the sublingual's as intended. Uh, and to see how that fares compared to a reference control, which would be typically an oral opioid from a human abuse potential perspective. Uh, oftentimes, uh, if you're dealing with a fentanyl patch and now you're chewing it, you may get very high exposure, which could be unsafe. So any kind of manipulated methods with these would have to be carefully weighed out in terms of how much dose they release, particularly with a potent uh, molecule such as fentanyl. Um, but uh, simulation studies can be done, for example, if, uh, if an extraction leads to a certain percentage of yield of active product, you could do a, um, a comparative intravenous study with API that's suitable for injection, not necessarily from the film itself. Uh, so there are a number of creative ways that, that can be done clinically, but always bearing the safety of the subjects in mind first. Okay. Thank you. Uh, We have another question. Uh, This one for Beatrice. How is individual recreational abuser response standardized in a house study? Because it it is a categorical scale. Yes. So usually what will happen uh, in these types of study designs, you have something called a qualification phase. Uh, So when subjects are screened they are screened based on their past opioid experience, for example. So they'll have to have used an opioid for at least 10 times in the past year and at least once recently, for example, once in the past six, at least once in the past 60 days. However, that's a self-reported and that can be variable because uh, subjects can be taking different types of opioids at different potencies at different doses. So we do what is called a qualification phase. And this is a phase where they will receive the active control, for example, oxycodone, maybe 30 or 40 milligrams orally, and they will receive a placebo in a double-blind randomized fashion. And during the testing session, we will then ask them, uh, we will administer all of the questionnaires, including the drug liking, the high, and all of the subjective endpoints that we use for the main study. And the subjects actually need to show a robust response to the active control relative to placebo in order to be even eligible into the study. And this enables us to confirm that both the subjects are sensitive to the dose, they're able to report the the effects of the opioid versus placebo appropriately, and they can also tolerate the dose. So there is a form of standardizing the test results in terms that they have to have at least a 15 point difference on that visual analog scale um, between the placebo and the active control, bearing in mind that it's a bipolar scale. So the placebo response is a neutral in the middle. It's a 50 points. So between 50 to 100, you increase in drug liking. When you go below 50, you're in disliking mode. But to the positive control, you would uh, present in a positive manner. Uh, so then you know, the, the studies are then active and placebo controlled to give you anchors as to where your product fits into a placebo response versus a active control response in the main study. Those subjects would then be enrolled into the main part of the study where you would have your treatment, uh, your investigational drug, your active control, and placebo administered. Right? So it's a comparative analysis. 
Okay. So we have one final question, and uh, I'd like to get uh, both uh, Eric's and Beatrice's perspective on this. Some of the interviewees stated that any ADF is defeatable. Are ADFs intended to deter occasional recreational users or determine addicted hardcore users? Go ahead, Beatrice. Well, that's an and I think it depends on the type of formulation. Uh, so, for example, if you have a, um, a, a formulation that has an antagonist in it, for example, that is certainly going to be far more deterrent to an opioid-dependent individual who will now be at risk of precipitating withdrawal, which we know is very unpleasant for users, versus a recreational drug user who will have perhaps a diminished response. They don't like that either. But certain formulations may target, uh, may have differential responses depending on the occasional user versus a very uh, hardcore user. Uh, certainly the more hardcore users are gravitating to more aggressive routes of administration such as intravenous. Um, they're more motivated at that point to oftentimes circumvent the withdrawal symptoms <clears throat> excuse me, more so than, than get, obtaining a high. So the motivations in these populations are quite different. And the way that the formulas, uh, the formulations are formulated will um, differentially affect these populations. And, and, we, it's, and it's good to understand that this is a, a very diversified population with very different motives in, in terms of a, an occasional user versus a, a hardcore user. So with, with occasional users, many of them will, will take it orally. Uh, so for the most part, unless there is an oral, um, uh, most of the formulations currently marketed uh, actually don't address oral overconsumption or oral use uh, as an as abuse method. So that's uh, one area that I think there's some innovation being done in terms of uh, circumventing overconsumption in an oral capacity, but most of them are targeting intranasal and intravenous routes, which are now progressing to a little bit more frequent uh, opioid use and certainly downstream to more problematic use. And if I would just add a couple of, you know, a couple of things, you know, most of the physical and chemical barriers are designed to, you know, I, I like to think of them as being designed to prevent that initial progression from, you know, intentional um, oral abuse to, you know, more intranasal and IV abuse. So you're sort of stopping that opioid progression or opioid abuse progression right at the beginning. So hopefully you're targeting, you know, the college kids at the party or you heard some of those guys say, you know, if, if it's more than five minutes, they're not going to do it at the party unless they're with other advanced abusers. So I think that if we can, you know, stop it early, um, hopefully, hopefully we can make a difference downstream in that too. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for attending. I'd like to thank our presenters and uh, here's contact information if you have further questions.